very good to be here and we're very pleased to be doing this webinar today. Uh, after more than three painful decades and a dozen additional, a dozen years of litigation, on September 11th last month, uh, a member of the Salvadoran Military High Command uh, was found guilty in a Spanish court of the 1989 massacre of six Jesuit priests and two women in El Salvador and sentenced in that Spanish court to 133 years in prison. Almudena Bernabal, the co-founder and director of the Guernica 37 group, uh, along with her Spanish co-counsel Manuel Oya Cese, led the private prosecution in Spain in this historic trial. The extraordinary journey of this case included the first extradition from the US to Spain of a foreign national. I'm very pleased to welcome Amadena back to class and this webinar today about the case. She has not only played a pathbreaking pivotal role in this case, but has played an exceptional role uh, on transitional justice cases throughout the Americas. And in fact, with Guernica 37 throughout the world. Among these cases in the Americas has been the genocide trial of General Efrain Rios Montt in Guatemala in 2013, the peace accords in Colombia in 2016, as well as the lead up to those accords, the trial of the murderer of iconic Chilean folk singer Victor Jara, and of course, this precedented setting case concerning the horrific murders in El Salvador. Our format today will be straightforward. Almudena will speak, uh, and give background on the case and discuss what happened in Spain. And then we will take your questions. If you didn't submit one in advance, you'll have an opportunity to do so during the webinar. Uh, with that, I'm very pleased to turn the dis discussion over to Almudena. Hello, uh, thank you so much, uh, Harley in particular, and everybody at class. It's delightful, um, even in this format, this new, this new way of doing things, but it's delightful to be back and to share one more time uh, the work that we do. And, and, and well, <clears throat> in a time of a lot of backlashes, some good news, I hope, for everybody. My hope was to uh, do an overview um, of the crime and, and, and perhaps talk about things, no, not so much the procedural story of what brought us to this trial and this decision, although of course that is of relevance, but also perhaps talk about those things that are less obvious and they contribute, in my opinion, to the quest for justice and accountability and, and somehow um, counter argument, you know, goes against these arguments of oh, why justice and why these uh, seeking for justice after all these years. And for those just briefly about the crime, and I know that this is a crime that everybody remembers young uh, and, and old, although it took place a while back in 1989 as El Salvador was frankly, 10 years into an internal armed conflict, as we know it, or a civil war, and trying to find, it was a, a guerrilla group in, in a resistance group, trying to find a, a government, a military dictatorship, and later a, a sequence of military governments. It had come to a very, I guess, cruel point, and in 1989, as uh, a number of, of leaders, uh, social leaders, religious leaders, and, and this particular gentleman, the uh, men, a priest, Jesuit priest from the Central University, uh, what they guess called the, the Central American University in San Salvador, were trying to find a negotiated solution to this war. 
And well, since the armed forces were not really uh, agreeing with that and wanted to perpetuate uh, the war and the benefits that we can discuss perhaps more in questions and answers that were represented for them, they ordered a battalion in a very uh, complex, so to speak, uh, military operation, they ordered a battalion to kill Ignacio Yacuria, a liberation theologian, a priest, and a, at the time, the president of this university that I mentioned. And the phrase they, they became so unpopular was, leave no witnesses. We precipitated the assassination of eight human beings, six Jesuit priests and two women, an employee and their daughter, about 15 year old. That crime, perhaps I wanted to remember the, the moment, 1989, in the Americas, in the, towards the end of Cold, the Cold War, right before the, the Berlin Wall uh, fell, and, 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 a, and a moment where I suppose this crime took the world and shocked the world in, in a way so much and when the u.s civil society which i think is important always to say so the u.s was not only an ally of the military but also the u.s civil society was demanding for these kind of intervention and support to the armed forces in the region to stop and in that moment this crime kind of well, had the ability, which I think is something that is, is meaningful to end the war and really precipitated ironically what those priests had been trying so hard, which is to finish, to end that civil war. And a, a process began, uh, sponsored by the United Nations, to seek the peace. Uh, a truth commission was formed, a report was um, was issued a brief report, and this is something else that I like to mention in, in some of these talks, because it is the only report in the Americas done, in this case, with international sponsorship and the UN sponsorship that named those responsible. Uh, the, the time is going to require me to fast forward, but I think it's important for people to know that because those uh, members of the high, the military high command, those that have been investigated and reported as the, the those responsible, that Truth Commission report already said in 1992 that the high command of the armed forces had orchestrated an order and of course eventually through this battalion carried something that they insisted in denying for well now 31 years. Since then uh, the Jesuits, the families of the Jesuits and the women assassinated were seeking justice and a number of efforts materialized all of them to avail. They tried to seek justice in San Salvador and in a, in a national court, which was for the Jesuit community the priority, and that failed. They tried the regional bodies with the Inter-American Commission, the Inter-American system, which also obviously was uh, largely delayed as uh, pretty much because the system is like that. And, um, you know, yeah, years went forward and there was never really uh, the desire to abandon this pursuit for justice, but they really had run perhaps out of, of venues or possibilities. I like you to always speak in track uh, of something that was happening in, in the United States. And I like to mention because they are it's very close to Berkeley, it's very close to professionals and and students and, and, and dynamics that were happening just um, on the East Bay, which is the putting together some cases under U.S. laws, the Alien Tort the Statue in particular, where remedies could be provided for victims of human rights abuses committing to El Salvador. Uh, these cases are, were a number of them, Professor Patty Bloom, at the time the director of the Human Rights Clinic at Berkeley, uh, was very highly involved. And I think that this created an awareness of uh, two things, perhaps, that the, the depth and the gravity of the violence committed during that period in El Salvador, but also, frankly, that there were alternatives, that they, they internationally, things were happening, people were talking about this new creative thing called international criminal law. In Spain, as you all, I think, know very well, uh, thanks to also the involvement of Berkeley, this um, 
uh, crazy lawyers had tried to sit uh, to get uh, Augusto Pinochet, former Chilean dictator, uh, extradited from the United Kingdom into Spain to face trial. So something was was moving. Years passed, and I think that some of these success, some successes in court, some outreach, and some exposure of what these violations took place as simultaneously these cases in Spain were advancing with, um, what I wanna say, with some soft results, because we always, uh, well, as we can imagine, these cases are not popular for uh, political elites, or uh, it's really represent a controversy that I don't particularly understand, but they will not make people uncomfortable. So the opportunity came in the case uh, for the Jesuits is something that I should mention is that as, as these laws that we know as universal jurisdiction or universal justice were advancing and they were also being, what I want to say, undermined a little bit, one concept appeared in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, which is what is called the passive personality. These cases could go forward and it was something that as litigators were paying attention or lawyers on behalf of the victims could go forward as long as you had victims uh, of the Spanish nationality in this particular instance or of the nationality of the country. With that opportunity and having five of the priests being of Spanish nationality, we embarked in this quest in 2008 and we filed a, a criminal complaint in Spain. Uh, needless to say, because we're 12 years into it, or we were 12 years into it, that these cases uh, take a long time. But perhaps what I think is, is important is that as, as much as justice should be prompt and should happen uh, near the crime and obviously close to, to that time, and the time can can be, and it, and it is to the frustration of the victims, I also think that sometimes in the Jesuits case prove show some of that, the time can, can be helpful, can, can work in our favor. It was, um, it was in this sort of a slow motion that this type of cases um, start. We were representing, I should say, the family of one of the Jesuits assassinated, Ignacio Martin Baro. There was a number of them, but the family really wanted to come forward, and then a couple of organizations, the Center for Justice and Accountability, eh, at the time part of the of the case in the Spanish Pro Human Rights Association. As a, as a group of, of prosecutors, we thought that we would have uh, more strength. Perhaps the, the, the unique nature of, of this case, or one of the things that, first of all, provided for the trial that then we had in July and that precipitated this decision is, and I was, I was saying, it's more my analysis, that how time can become your ally instead of your enemy in some instances, is that enough time had passed, and this is my opinion and my perception, to have a generation at the Department of Justice under the Obama administration, but even later under the Trump administration, to, um, to see things differently. And when we discovered that one of the defendants, Inocente Orlando Montana, was happily living in Massachusetts with his sister and had actually lied on his uh, immigration status in order to secure his temporary protective status, what we call TPS, to remain in this country, we were able to persuade the Department of Justice that this guy needed to be arrested. Perhaps uh, the Department of Justice obviously did a great work, a great job, and, and prioritized the legality of the United States laws and the violation. And the huge, perhaps, uh, question at the time was, can we make the actual crime valuable? I mean, this, we don't want this to be diluted by just an immigration um, felony, as, as important as that can be, and obviously uh, he needed to, to observe the law and to face the charges, but can we make the, the actual crime, this crime against humanity, that then this, this terrorism, state terrorism, you know, to prevail, and we were able, uh, and it was a great team effort, and it was really what I believe in. You, we had lawyers in the United States led by Patty Bloom, we had uh, the Department of Justice, naturally. We had uh, the, Spanish just, the Spanish investigating judge, Eloy Velasco, working with the U.S. authorities. The, 
the important evidence that the investigation will have gathered in Spain to the service of this prosecution and an extradition was granted by a judge in North Carolina in 2017. That is, as you said very well, Harley, an introduction unprecedented because the United States, it's not a friend and we've seen that recently with the sanctions to the International Criminal Court and others, it's never been a big fan of this transnational or international prosecution, or as they are, it's called here, extraterritorial. But in this case, I think a number of circumstances, and obviously we had the legal basis, we had the persuasive uh, extradition request from Spain, but also I do believe that there was a sense of of understanding the importance of these crimes not to go unpunished, that this generation of the Department of Justice uh, understood and, and facilitated somehow. The, the importance of this extradition is not only as, as it is because it's a huge, and it's the first universal jurisdiction case ever tried in Spain that involved the extradition of a third country, in this case, the United States. But the importance is also that in a system like Spain, if you don't have a defendant physically present, you cannot have a trial. So the importance was in addition to that is the facilitated having um, having a trial. Little that we knew that we will have a pandemic and we didn't, you know, with the trial was scheduled, uh, Montano arrived in Spain in 2017 and as the procedural uh, phases were exhausted, we got ready for trial and it was announced that we will have a trial in 2020, June 2020, which we were gearing up and the legal team moving into a lot of filings until March obviously brought the lockdown. The extraordinary, perhaps, circumstances is that the, um, the trial, the, the justices, you know, we were thinking, we have waited for so long, it's funny, you know, it was an encounter of opinions. As past counsel, we're thinking, we have waited so long, that we are now waiting a little bit more and have a, a meaningful and complete trial. And the reading of the justices, which I happen to now have come to understand and agree, was this has been too long. And we don't want to wait any longer. Not for the victims, obviously, not for the defendant, everybody's. And they decided to go ahead and to go with the times and create a platform, which I think is the unthinkable where the, where the trial will be televised. It's a YouTube channel specifically created for uh, this trial. And something they will have in our wildest dream is that um, people from El Salvador was able to see this trial on real time. At some point, according to the technician of the Spanish National Court, the high court where, where this trial took place, told me there was 100,000 people watching the trial at once, which I thought was extraordinary. Not in my wildest dream, I will have imagined that we will have something with that kind of popular uh, flavor. As, as you're really trying to reivindicate not only the rights of the victim directly, but the rights of the many thousands of victims, Salvadorans, that died at the hands of the armed forces and the security forces in El Salvador. Um, the trial was a success, perhaps something that I wanted to, to bring up and that I think is also close to home uh, in your introduction, Harley, and to class in particular, is I think that I would like to highlight the, the importance of having 30 years or perhaps 12 years of litigation and the importance of the commitment of the witnesses that came through to testify. One thing that was innovative in Spain, and, and, and you know very well, you, I mean, I think that this is well known, was what they call intelligence witnesses. They, they, what we call in the United States, the expert witness testimony. Something that I like to, to bring up because these cases, uh, whether it was the alien turtle statue when I was doing it in the US federal courts, or these cases, universal jurisdiction, have, Obviously, 30 years have passed. It's very limited our ability to have evidence that is hot and immediate and recently obtained. We have to rely on researchers, on investigators. We have to rely on academics. And we have to rely on archives in this case uh, through the declassification of, of, the, of the documents by the US government. And I think that that is shaping 
and extremely qualified you know, academics. They have devoted their life to understand the in and outs of um, these countries, these extraordinary circumstances, the political interactions, the, the treatment of the victims, and create these reports. And I want to mention, not because we are a class, but I work with Be Professor Beatriz Manth, who was exactly that for the genocide case. And she did an extraordinary report that allowed uh, her 25 years plus career of research of that country and the circumstances to come and become a very qualified opinion. In this case, we had Professor Terry Carl from Stanford, who is very well known uh, in the Bay Area, who has devoted her entire life to analyze the classified documents and understand those things that are never written of foreign policy, diplomacy. And I I think, you know, she always says we need to train the, gen the next generation of those kind of, of professionals. Perhaps it's true. Uh, uh, this, and that's what I wanted to point out, this litigation uh, requires, and for those who really love international human rights and, and impact litigation, an important amount of creativity within the boundaries of, of the law. Just to, um, then I will leave it there, that I think I've already passed a few minutes, but the, the, the decision came down <clears throat> uh, beautifully on the 11th, uh, following perhaps this special quality of the trial, the justices decided to read publicly the, the verdict. In the, it's, a, it's a 128 pages decision, it's public, even in Spanish, if anybody is happy, is available. I mean, anybody's interested, I'm happy to, to share. It has to point out more technical, but I think something, something's very important for the movement of international criminal law, uh, I think is the recognition at the sentence, and this is not because it touches me, but I think it's very important of the, the importance of the victim's lawyers, and I don't mean us, but I mean that the importance that the victims have access to these proceedings. As in many countries, the victims are left behind, which was no different in El Salvador after the Truth Commission. I think they're providing for these models, private prosecutions, or right now in the transitional justice process in Colombia, where the victims never need to be forgotten. And through their counsel, they need to have this standing, this ability to have agency. And perhaps uh, the desire to, as, as I mentioned, at the, uh, Montano was a member of the high command, of the armed forces, which means his responsibility for this crime was by ordering or belonging to the group that ordered it. Something that, as we all know, our leaders in many countries are also quite allergic. You know, they don't want this indirect ability to make responsible the brains of these crimes and not those who execute them. And this decision embraces very innovative ways of going after well, well, but in Latin America, it's called intellectual actors. I mean, which at the end of the day is what you want. It's not the poor soldier. I think that they carry a particular order. But those who, when they have power and they are in positions of power, not only commit these crimes, but then secure impunity afterwards. I think that this is um, a decision that brings hope in the fight against impunity. The 31 years have passed, but it still can be done. Uh, it says, you know, I was a young woman and had no gray hair when this trial began, and so now I'm almost 50. <laughs> Whatever you want to make with that, I'm a child and married. But it, it was, but it was a beautiful honor and a journey, and it makes me feel that uh, hopefully we can make it shorter and faster, but it makes me feel there's still room, very much room for uh, victims accessing to justice. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for that. Uh exceptional overview and the background on the case. And for me, the way you close the notion that this is a decision that brings hope, gives meaning to that 30 years of determination, courage, sacrifice uh, of all those that were involved in ultimately bringing this to justice in Spain. On a personal note, I, as so many others at that time, uh, remember vividly, even after almost a decade of unspeakable horror in El Salvador, let alone Guatemala and other countries in Central America, there was something so outrageous 
and ugly and horrific about this crime and meant to be so. Uh, we, we being, you mentioned Professor Beatrice Mons at Berkeley, uh, were in Guatemala a year later, staying with a close friend of Professor Mons, uh, the noted Guatemalan anthropologist, Marina Mack. She had come back a year earlier uh, after being in exile, uh, after so many death threats uh, in the United Kingdom. And we spent an evening talking about the Jesuits and the two women in El Salvador. She had worked with all of them. She was close to a number of them. Uh, and in the conversation, the courage for her and her fiance to be back in Guatemala was extraordinary. The importance of shattering impunity, even 30 years later, is the fact that a week or two after that evening, she herself was murdered in Guatemala City uh, in that same spirit of, of terror and intimidating others. So the impact of the case, uh, I think, and what it means despite the passage of time remains very, very significant. So with that, let me go to some of the questions uh, that we've received. And they range across uh, a variety of topics related to the case. Uh, Mary from San Francisco writes, what is the possibility of prosecution of this case in El Salvador? Um, actually, this very, um, thank you, Mary, because the time didn't allow me to say that the, the way the case, and that was true in Guatemala, the way the case has been shaped, uh, we always were in touch with Salvadorans. They have been part, obviously, led aside the university, but lawyers and activists. And we have always, I mean, so much that you can measure, but the impact of the case is something that is very important for us. The case in the two, and don't want to go into very, very details, but there was twice that the Spanish court at our request asked for the extradition of all other defendants who, by the way, remain in El Salvador where they feel safe. That, um, not alone, but those two requests, which actually scare, if you allow me, the crap out of the military, because the government said, oh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna deny it, we're not gonna, they didn't help either, but my point is that it got, uh, tumultuous enough that the Supreme Court of El Salvador ended up, ended up getting rid, um, of the amnesty law. So some momentum was created. I mean, I'm, explaining, I'm explaining in a very simplistic way, but what we have right now is 13 of the 15 defendants naming the case, presumably in, El San, in San Salvador. I think there's some in the United States we haven't been able to find them, but presumably in San Salvador. And um, a constitutional law that has been set aside and a room has been created for these cases. There's one attempt in El Salvador for the massacre in El Mozote. Um, they happened in 1980, and that's been moving forward. Professor Terry Cal, that I mentioned before, is, is very much involved as a witness in that case. And we are hoping that we can support, and that this case brings some momentum, because the legal basis are there, to your question, uh, to be able to open some of these prosecutions, this one in particular, in, in El Salvador. Thank you. Then. Peter writes from Washington, what impact will the conviction have on the possibility of future human rights trials in Spain? But again, it's a very good question because what happened in Spain, which, you know, I admit it because it's, it's, um, it's sad <laughs> to say the least. In Spain, the legislature under a very conservative um, um, administration, a couple of them, undermine severely the universal jurisdiction provision in the law. The first one was in 2009, that as I think I hinted, left us with only US, I'm sorry, US citizens, Spanish citizens 
uh, of victims. And the second one, which is horrendous in 2014, really was designed just to destroy the law whatsoever. We survived only because we had the claim of a state terrorism and, this, and the five Spaniards. But I mean, it's like jurisdictionally was extremely tight and the extradition was based on that. There is a bill um, there's some renewed, you know, idea that universal jurisdiction uh, was, is less bad. There is a bill right now pending that could bring back to what it was in 2009. But what I will say to this, to the question specifically, is that they're, they're, the biggest criticism, even from, for those who believe in human rights and international criminal court, uh, in the, the national debate in Spain was, this is not feasible. The prosecutors in Spain don't have um, the ability to act, investigate, or, you know, everything has to do through international cooperation. If countries don't want to cooperate, if we don't have engagement on some other way, we cannot do our job. And to be frank, that's true. I mean, I've never said otherwise. If you are a prosecutor sitting in one country and you have to investigate in the Philippines, it's going to be a little bit overwhelming. Now, that's what I think we've been trying to say. If you have victims attorneys or plaintiffs attorneys and you have a, 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 over, a, a renewed and more stimulated ability for countries to cooperate and then you can have these cases in maybe i'm over optimistic but the jesuits a prosecution the different proceedings and the things that happen a puts one to this international legal team that it was my little dream that we have lawyers here, there, there. And we were all working really well together. I think showed to those to the detractors that you can actually have a team that can facilitate the work of the prosecutors and the investigative judges and have, uh, nothing is gonna be easy, it wasn't easy, I'm not saying that, but it's actually feasible. And I think, I hope that the Jesuits case so it serves a very answer, long answer, but serves a little bit to change that mentality that this is doable. And it can be done with rigor and in a serious way. Uh, just a brief comment on what you just mentioned when you, when you talk about all the obstacles, all the time that is involved. And it's so easy to say this case has uh, gone 30 years, but the the difficulty of keeping a case alive, let alone bringing it to justice for three decades, is impossible to fathom, yet the impact of it is pretty extraordinary. So with that, uh, Carlos writes uh, from San Salvador, does the process continue regarding the investigation of more authors or intellectual accomplices? In Spain, the, the, we tried. In Spain, we were, um, we included everybody. I think everybody meaning, as I mentioned before, the high command, those who were indirectly responsible, responsible for the orders, and those who executed. And we even tried uh, to include for um, former President Alfredo Cristiani, who at the time was uh, well, head of the armed forces and president of the country, for uh, covering up the crime, which I think his role has been international and internationally be proven that he engaged with a number of military in trying to delude the truth and try to hide what really happened and support the the armed forces in in getting in getting away with it, but the the case the case in Spain, as I said, I mean, I think that throughout the investigation, all of that was was part of the case. At the phase of trial, we were limited to the to the defendant present in the case, at least against Montano is. Um, is over. But as I said, the investigation, the work of Professor Terry Carl, of other witnesses, we found this wonderful uh, military lawyer in the United States, Luis Parada, a member of the, the intelligence services of the armed forces, with a lot of information. So what I'm hoping is that this comes back and what it should happen is that this has, as I said, a, a, a strong and long tail in El Salvador. Uh, this is a question that goes in a bit of a different direction. Uh, Holly writes from San Diego, 
Do you see a relationship between liberation theology and the articulation of human rights in the second half of the 20th century? That's a beautiful question. I hope I'm not disappointing her because it's not, I'm no academic and no expert. I just have read liberation theology and I've been a big fan of, of the fathers, but I do believe that uh, the basis of liberation theology, the theory after Puebla and Medellin, after the, the conventions that brought the Catholic Church and the rethinking of theology, born within the Americas and understanding the inequality and the endemic poverty uh, in Latin America was decisive. To, first of all, to change to me Catholic and Christian beliefs uh, to be a little bit more truthful to, to, to the writings and, and the Bible, et cetera, but also change, it also contributed enormously to a dialogue of human rights, basic rights, fundamental rights, and, and the, the need of changing systems uh, then they didn't change in the, the perpetuated privilege for some and, and, and horrible conditions for others, which I think is at the core of, of human rights and even at the core of social and economic rights at later to human rights evolve. So I think that they, they were very important. But that's a personal opinion, I must say. <laughs> well, we have time for two more questions. Uh, and uh, uh, this question is from Beatriz in California. Can you tell us what type of cases does Guernica 37 take and which ones are coming up? Well, Guernica is um, an effort, actually it's, it's not doing anything different than what many of us um, and colleagues of mine uh, have been doing, which is uh, fighting impunity through legal means and, and engaging in, in processes and supporting what we call transitional justice and genetically, but I think transformative processes for countries coming out of dictatorships and coming out of of the state inflicted violence, what Kernika wants to do, and it was kind of the, the, the decision that at my, you know, half of the century, it's the, to try to do it differently, to try to engage more, to be more meaningful in the home countries. That was a big deficiency that some of us detected, and you know, my partners at Kernika agree with me, and we came together to realize that, um, as many know, and perhaps they, to me, the Guatemalan uh, genocide case and the Jesuits are proof of that, to be able to be effective, and I don't mean to win a case, I mean to be effective to the country, to, to seize the opportunity in Guatemala was a beautiful change in circumstances that allow for a national prosecution in Spain, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Jesuits was a Department of Justice that decides to extradite or a judge that decides to extradite. But if you want to seize the circumstances, you need to be very involved with the national reality of that country. What is needed? What is preferred? What is the priority? How is that process going to happen? So Guernica is doing that right now in what is next. We have a lot of work in the, I think the MENA in Northern Africa regions are very important regions in the dynamics of the world. Latin America, uh, we've been working in Venezuela. Venezuela has the potential of having a very, very negative effect for the region. So we've been trying to help civil society to find a way to, to transcend this terrible political crisis. And in terms of cases, well, we've been working in West Africa. I think that these are regions that are going to be, with Latin America, always very significant in, in this fight for actually undermining human rights that is very present and very real, even in the context of the pandemic. There are some consequences that this pandemic in the shortening of human rights are, are having directly. And I think these regions of the world can lead. So that's what I think we've been doing. Uh, and then finally, uh, this on a personal note, after all the work on this case, you were in Spain, co-directing the private prosecution. Before the verdict was presented, what was your expectation? And how did it feel 
when the actual verdict came down? You know, I, it's very funny because it happens to me before. I, in terms of the expectation, once the evidence made it to the, um, you know, I have this perhaps very simplistic way of seeing the world black and white still, hardly in, in the, um, this old. So when, when I'm so convinced that, you know, that the world was genuine, that the, those who came forward were very brave witnesses, and the common sense behind the things that they said, how they said it, I think I was uh, expecting a decision, perhaps not as, as good because it was uh, pretty harsh, but I was expecting a, a, a decision uh, in a ju and a judgment in our favor because of the, it's also the, the way that, you know, it's very strange, but the way the judges take notes in a particular statements said by witnesses and, and gives you tips that, that they are going your way. How did I feel? I was really a little numb. I don't feel much. <laughs> it takes me about three days <laughs> to realize it's such a long time. Perhaps it's the worst. Um, I always say publicly that I fear apathy. You know, sometimes the lapse of time makes me feel that do I have the energy? Do I have, what am I going to to keep going? And what it did is that it brought back a lot of that energy that I need. So it was great. It was great. On that note, let me just conclude by saying we were very, very pleased to have you with us today and the extraordinary work you have done, which has required such innovation, such courage, such determination, uh, and endless obstacles has really made a difference. Uh, and we thank you for that. And this case in particular, I think is important and could lead to other precedents going forward. So thank you and we thank everyone for participating in this webinar.